Ah, ya, eso. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Shore Bible Church South, and just another church ministry. I'm Pastor Arthur Johnson. I want to thank you for joining us for another study in God's Word. Let us bow our hearts in the Word of Christ. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're coming for your throne of grace with hearts of thanksgiving, thanking you for who you are, the God of heaven and earth, the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you committed your love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, spare not your own, only son, but delivered him up for us all. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of thee in him. We thank you too for the privilege and the blessing of being able to come together for the study of your word. And as we do so, Heavenly Father, we pray that we receive it, not as the words of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. And we pray, Heavenly Father, we we'll receive it with all readiness of mind, but then search the scriptures daily to see whether or not these things are so. And confirm them to be so, Heavenly Father, to have a readiness and a willingness to respond to your word in the obedience of faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> All right. Take your Bibles, turn to 
Um, well, let me just. Well, I tell you what. Get Second uh, Timothy. Second Timothy, chapter three. Second Timothy, chapter three, verse sixteen and seventeen. And get Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. And I want, and, and we, we probably get one other passage to 2 Timothy. Thank you. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. <clears throat> I want to use these verses to preface again as a lead into our continued study of the books, Hebrews to Revelation. Now in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, Paul writes, he says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We can take that statement to be a statement uh, regarding all of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. All scripture, the Bible, the writing, is given by inspiration of God. That means that what we have before us is God's word. But we also have information or revelation that God wanted to communicate to men. Okay. That would include Hebrews to Revelation. Now, I point that out because we who put a great emphasis on rightly dividing the word of truth go to the put go to the point of well we we, we make the point of pointing out that Romans to Philemon is God's word to us and about us. And many have interpreted us to be saying that the only books of the Bible that is of any real significance or of any real importance are just those books, Romans to Philemon. And so we've been uh, wrongly accused of basically discarding the rest of the Bible. Now, anybody that knows us, listen to us on a regular basis, knows that's not true. Yes, we do believe and teach that God's word to us and about us is in Romans to Philemon. And we unashamedly say that all the Bible is for you, but it's not all to you. All the Bible is for you, but it's not all about you. And we say that to make the point that we're not excluding any of the Bible. So as 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Okay? So we read it all, we study it all. But we most certainly do not try to interpret it all to us or about us. And that's where the problem comes with the majority of Christendom at large. They see all of the Bible, 
uh, from Genesis to Revelation as being not just simply for us, but to us and about us. What's the question? For who? Yeah. Sorry about the interruption. Um, so look at Romans 15, 4. Yes, Romans to Philemon is where we get our doctrine from. Where we know the mind and the will of God for us today. But that does not discard or disregard those scriptures outside of, to the left of Romans or to the right of Philemon. In Romans 15 and verse 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. All of it's for our learning. Now go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2 in verse 15. Though all the Bible is, all scriptures given by inspiration, all of it is God's word. 2 Timothy 2.15 makes it abundantly clear that the word of God must be rightly divided. If you fail to rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, the workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you fail to rightly divide the word of truth, you might be scriptural in your presentation, in, in the things that you say. You may quote the Bible, but failing to rightly divide means that you're undispensational. And what it is to be undispensational is to, to take a teaching, to take a doctrine that was true at a different time for a different people and interpret that to yourself, to, to your time and to yourself when it has nothing to do with your time or yourself. And that's the problem. And it's been rightly said, the most dangerous Doctrine is to be scriptural, but undispensation. And that is you just go to the Bible, just read the Bible as if all of it is written to you and about you. And any reading should make it clear to you that you can't do that. You want to talk about contradictions. Uh, failing to rightly divide the word of truth will open you up to a host of contradictions of which you have no explanation for and will, will result really in being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Now, as we study Hebrews to Revelation, uh, Hebrews to Revelation, these epistles are not written to the church, which is the body of Christ, nor about the church, which is the body of Christ. These epistles, one, they are written to and about the kingdom messianic church. We'll get to talking more about that here in a moment. Secondly, they are epistles, letters that are addressed to
to Jewish people, to the Hebrews, to the Israelites, the recipients, the audience, that these letters, Hebrews to Revelation, are addressed to are Jewish. Again, the king, the kingdom messianic church, which is a Jewish Baptist church, not the body of Christ. And we'll, again, as I state, we'll get into a, a little bit more of that. But these epistles also, these, they are written about the end time or the last days. And when we talk about the end times or the last days, we're talking about the last days of prophecy, the last days of the prophetic program. They are not written about the dispensation of grace in which you and I live. The dispensation that you and I live in is called the mystery or the dispensation of the grace of God. Hebrews to Revelation deals with prophecy, deals with the last days of the prophecy program. In those epistles, you will find that they present or they're consistent with kingdom doctrine. Doctrine that began to be taught by the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and in the early Acts period. Hebrews to Revelation is a rekindling and a continuation of such doctrines, of such teachings. Again, of such doctrine as presented in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and in the early Acts period, until you come to the Apostle Paul. When you come to Paul, there is a departure from the kingdom doctrine or the kingdom teaching, okay? And you're introduced in, to an entirely new system of doctrine. Paul refers to it as in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. He says, For this cause I call the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God given me to you, you're introduced to a whole new system of doctrine, beginning with the Apostle Paul. But Hebrews to Revelation. They're presenting kingdom doctrine, kingdom principles, not body doctrine, not body principles. Now, you may find some parallels um, or some common doctrine between the kingdom church and the body church that don't make them one and the same. Okay. And so those are, are the things that we're going to be looking at, as, as I stated, as we uh, continue to study through uh, Hebrews to Revelation. So the, the first point that these epistles, Hebrews to Revelation, are written to and about the kingdom mess, messianic church. If you recall... <coughs> Looking at John chapter 10 last week as a principal text to identify the kingdom messianic church. When we talk about the kingdom messianic church, we're talking about a specific category of saints, a, a specific category of believers that are separate and distinct from the church, which is the body of Christ, okay? 
In John chapter 10, I, last week I was trying to make the point that the Kingdom Messianic Church is a taking out of the apostate Israel. And identified as a new community of believers unto itself, separated from the nation, from the nation of Israel. In John 10, verse 1, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. What God began to do under the ministry of John the Baptist was to separate out from the nation of Israel a believing remnant. We looked at John 1, where he says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And I tried to make the point there that you're not talking about anybody and everybody. You're talking about those to whom the Lord was preaching to was his own. The leadership, which represents the nation, rejected him. But apart from the leadership, there were many who believed on him. And as there, the, as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become his. They're that remnant. They're that believing remnant that God separates out from the unbelieving Israel. They are identified as the kingdom messianic church. Get Matthew 21. Matthew chapter 21. In Matthew 21, we're going to start that down at there's a parable starts at verse 33 that Jesus tells about a certain household who planted a vineyard. I think we looked at a part of this last last week. I want to get down to um, verse um, 40. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard come, what will he do unto those husbands? They say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men. Now, these are the, this is the nation, so to speak, that God has entrusted his vineyard to. Now, let me go back and read for the context. I'm not going to try to explain it all, but it's kind of disjointed if I don't read the beginning part of it. So let's start back at verse 33. Here another parable. There was a certain household of which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and dig a wine press in it and built a tower and led it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. The, the, the idea there is uh, entrusting um, what belongs to the Lord to the leadership of others. Okay. Those would be the uh, husbandmen and let it out to husbandmen. That would be representative of the leadership in Israel. The vineyard is Israel. Um, verse 34, when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husband. This would be the prophets. 
of old when God sent the prophets to the nation to speak to the religious leaders, to both the political and religious leadership of the nation. He sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. And he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. Again, the prophets of old. But last of all, he sent unto them his son. Now that will be the re reference to the first advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. He came unto his own. Okay. Something might be up too high. Just, you can still hear me? Okay, all right. Um, so where we're we? down in uh, verse 37. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. So you get the idea, this, this is the beginning of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But when the husbandman the religious leadership within the nation, both the political and religious leadership within the nation. But when the husband saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir, come, let us kill him, and let us seize upon his inheritance. And they caught, now you understand, with that kind of an attitude, it's abundantly clear that the nation had apostatized from God. They had departed from God. Okay. They were not in the will of God. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard come, what will he do unto those husbands? Now, that might be like a reference to the day of the Lord. They say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbands. Disregard my, my statement about the day of the Lord for the moment. Let's just continue to see this in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seeds. And the reason I'm showing you this passage is getting to the point where he talks about the, the where we're, we're identifying who the believing remnant is, to whom he entrusts the kingdom to. Okay, we'll see that here in a moment. Verse 42, Jesus saith unto them, Did ye ever read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same as become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say unto you, speaking to the religious leaders contemporaneous with Christ, the kingdom of God shall be what? Taken from you and given to who? Given to a nation, not the nations. The kingdom is not given to the nations. It is given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Okay. 
So go to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, Now let's start back at uh, verse, um, or let's just start at verse 22 and read that. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for the body, what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn. And God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If God so clothes the grass, which is today in the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven. How much more will he close you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. Now, there are clearly a, a, a distinction being made from the disciples of the Lord. They're being identified separate from the nations of the world. They're being identified separate from the Gentiles. So we know they're Jewish. That's my point. They're Israelites. They're Hebrews. Verse 31, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. And when you see a promise like that throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, know and understand this is the point that I started out with at the beginning. He's not talking to the church, the body of Christ. Okay? Okay. The idea of that is the teaching of the majority of Christendom today is for you to seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. That's an idea that is looking for God to fulfill such a promise in this lifetime, they don't teach it as a promise to come. They teach it as if you seek first the kingdom of God, then these other things, you know, um, I tell you what, hold your hand here for a moment. Look back at Mark. The Gospel of Mark. And chapter 10. And verse 28. Mark chapter 10, verse 28. Then Peter began to say unto him, to the Lord, Lo, we have left all 
and it followed the one of the principal doctrines of the kingdom. And majority of Christians don't, don't teach this. They want you to they want you to seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. But they don't follow the principal doctrine of that of the kingdom. And one of the principal doctrines of the kingdom was to sell all that you have. Now, you know, such a doctrine, by the way, would be counterproductive. That doctrine would be counteractive to and all these things shall be added to you if the promise of those things if that if you forsook those things those very things is what the Lord will give unto you just I mean it doesn't make sense to forsake it for the Lord to turn around and give it back to you I mean if you have it if you possess it you know, why give it up if if it's going to be just the Lord is going to just turn around and give it back to you. Doesn't make any sense. The Lord has a reason for telling the people to sell all that they have. Okay? Why that doctrine was a doctrine of, of the kingdom church. But in any case, let's finish. Uh, Peter says, we've done that. Peter said, and they did. They were fishermen. They had families. And they for, forsook it all and followed Jesus. That was seeking first the kingdom of God. So Peter, in the light of what Jesus said, Peter asked this question. We've left, verse 28 again, Lord, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospel. By the way, you remember Jesus saying, um, he that loveth mother, father, brother, sister more than me is not worthy of me, not worthy to follow him. Okay. Verse 30. But he says, but ye, he shall receive a hundredfold. You see that? He shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. Now watch the rest of the verse because this is where it doesn't make sense to have the expectation of the very things you're forsaking for the Lord to bless you with those very things in this time, in this lifetime. But ye shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses, now watch, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with what? With persecution. Now, I don't know, it, you know, the reading of it may be a little tricky, but I think it's clear. It ought to be clear. But he shall receive a hundredfold. Okay, he shall receive, and the question is, is when? That's the question. Yet, when is he going to receive such blessing? The verse says, in this time, if 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 you're preoccupied with houses, brethren, sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands. That comes with what? 
persecutions. That's my point. So what's the teaching? Sell all that you have. Because when the persecution comes, guess what? You don't have to be preoccupied with. With those things. Because the enemy is most certainly going to use those things against you. Okay? You're going to receive a hundredfold. Go, go, go to Matthew 19 so you understand clearly what I'm saying to you. That for the kingdom messianic church, they're not expected to get their blessings, that hundredfold blessing, until the kingdom. That's when they're going to get it. When the Lord comes and usher them into the kingdom, but look at Matthew 19. Same context, same subject matter. Then answer Peter, verse 27. Then answer Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and have followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Now watch what he says here. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me, in the regeneration, you see the timing? In the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon Twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or land, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. Is it clear as to when those who sought first the kingdom of God and these things shall be added unto you, the timing of those blessings being added? That's not a promise. That's not a promise to give you such blessings in this, at this point. It wasn't a promise to the kingdom of church. It most certainly is not a promise to the church, which is the body of Christ. <laughs> so sure. Oh, it might be a bad one. No, it might be a lot. We didn't put one in this book. Yeah, it's been about two weeks. No, I think. Yeah. I think that's what it is. But. but you don't get the blessing until the kingdom. Okay? Now that's the kingdom messianic church. Now, oh, oh. The time is running, getting away from me again, but go to Matthew 16. Matthew chapter 16. I think I've kind of covered that point sufficiently enough to move on. Matthew chapter 16. And I'm making the point that Hebrews to Revelation are not epistles or letters written to the church, the body of Christ, or about the church, which is the body of Christ, okay? They're written to the kingdom, messianic believers. The kingdom church, again, is a remnant taken out of the nation from amongst the nation of Israel and separated unto a community of believers unto themselves, separate from the nation at large. By the way, before I uh, go to Matthew 16, go back to Matthew chapter 9, and let me comment on the statement I just made to you. So you can see again what the Lord is doing, beginning with the, with the ministry of John the Baptist, about separating out this new community of believers calling out a remnant unto himself. And notice the nature of the ministry, what the ministry was about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
This most certainly is not about the church, the body of Christ. Matthew chapter 9, verse 14. Then came to him the disciples, that is, to Jesus, the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. Now watch what the Lord says here. No man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment. For that which is put in to fill it up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. They put new wine into new bottles. And what? Both are preserved. So the new wine is being put into new bottles. Who's the new bottles? The kingdom messianic church, this remnant that's being separated out by the baptism of John and by faith in Jesus as the Christ, the son of the living God. They're the new bottles. They're the remnant. And they are the reason the nation of Israel is preserved and not utterly destroyed. Go to Matthew 16 now. So beginning at verse 13, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? By the way, this question would, would have no relevance really with the Gentiles, the nations. So we know this is Israel, that this is a concern to. And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the Son of of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The nature and the character of this church is taken from the words in verse 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever shalt Thou shalt loose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged to his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus, the Christ. Now those two ideas in verse 19 and verse 20, or going back up to verse 16 as well. The kingdom of heaven. And Christ, 
the Messiah. Is where this church gets its identity. It is a kingdom messianic church. And it's Jewish because everything about the passage is Jewish. So when we talk about Hebrews to Revelation being written to the kingdom of Messianic church. That's what we're referring to. That's who we're talking about. Now, next week we'll see some more discerning, differing, inf distinguishing information about the kingdom church and the church which is the body of Christ. That we must rightly divide between these two community of believers, how they are not one and the same. To make them one and the same is to commit a grave error when it comes to the Word of God and in interpreting the Word of God. If you make them one and the same, you're going to commit errors which have no solution to them. That will, you will create problems of which you have no answers for by making the kingdom church, the kingdom messianic church, and the church which is the body of Christ, to make them one and the same is to produce unsolvable problems for your understanding. Of, and, and one of the unsolvable problems is is instability. That you can have no stability in the church and in its doctrine, in its teaching, to confuse those two communities of belief, to confuse those two churches as one and the same. All right? Any questions? All right, if you have questions on Facebook, again, let me encourage you to leave your questions in the comments there. And uh, again, we do look, look over the comments. And uh, if we see them, uh, we'll try to address your question to the best of our ability. Yeah, Many times we hear that scripture that says, I'm going to take the kingdom away from you and give it to others. Mm -hmm. And people kind of think, oh, well, yeah, that's us. You know, I'm going to give it to us. And, but you point out clearly in the context that it's talking about Israel, the leadership. And yes. Taking it from them and giving it to the little. To the little. Oh, that's, that's the verse I get. Yeah. Luke 12. I got to give you this one because oh, okay. I mentioned it and did because. I didn't give it to you. Uh -huh. uh, it's going to be hanging out there well, on the tape. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> right. So let me, let me, uh, Luke 12. Now, this is in conjunction with Matthew 21 43 scripture. Mm -hmm. And I meant to go there, and something else came up. Yeah, we went there, but I, I, mm -hmm. I, I emphasized a different point when I got there okay. than the one that I wanted to emphasize in conjunction with Matthew 21, 43. The kingdom shall be taken from you yeah. and given to a nation. Mm -hmm. Again, I wanted to identify them, that a nation. Yeah. So Luke 12, 32, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He's going to take it from the religious leaders of Israel, of the apostate nation. He's going to invest that authority in the little flock. Mm -hmm. And if you remember John 10, 1, uh, about the door into the sheepfold, that sheepfold is the little flock. Mm -hmm. Those people who are separated out by the baptism of John, mm -hmm. they're identified in 
uh, as a separate and distinct community of believers. Their identity, they are the kingdom messianic church, or they are the little flock to whom Christ took the kingdom from the, the apostate nation and gave it to the little flock. That little flock is that nation referred to in Matthew 21, 43, to whom Christ invested the authority of the kingdom. And you see the importance of that in a passage that oftentimes is used to teach things about the church, the body of Christ, that just isn't true. Over there, and I think it's in 1 Peter, 2 Peter, about being a kingdom of priests oh, yeah. and holy nation, a royal priesthood, yeah. has nothing to do with the church, the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so we'll, get, we'll try to remember to get into that next week, Lord willing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for reminding me of that. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Brother Bob, would you close us in a word of prayer, please? Well, most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for this being you, the one true living God of the universe, the most high God, the God and Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for his work on the cross, the secret gospel, the salvation today that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures of Mary and Rose and Lent. And those of us who believe that message, not only Mary and personally, results in our of being baptized and identified into the body of Christ. And we see so clearly here in the writings of our the scriptures that um, we must make a distinction between the little flock, the kingdom, messianic church and uh, the body of Christ church is that we, uh, we know how to operate together and uh, not be confused and unstable so we can present a clear message and uh, live our life in truth with the word of God right in the body. We thank you for that. We thank you for uh, this going to be uh, passed in this family. We trust that we continue to teach the word right in the body continue to share that it is clear that we can share with others so it's clear to them. And we just all to your praise, honor, and glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.